Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with ericstrains.com. Today we're going to be doing an in-depth review and running of yet another amazing engine to come out of Lionel's Vision line of products. In this case, it's the Vision line take on the legendary Lionel 700E Hudson. Before I start this review, I want to give you a little bit of a history lesson about the original 700E because I feel that in order to appreciate this new rendition of the 700E, you need to know a little bit of the backstory and the history of the original 700E. Now, fortunately for all of you, within the last couple of weeks, I just finished reading a book that documents the entire history of Lionel, and so the history and the story of the original 700E is fresh in my mind. So for any of you who are not familiar with the 700E, this will be your chance to get a little history lesson on what is probably the most legendary engine that Lionel ever made. The original 700E was manufactured by Lionel in 1937 during what is called the pre-war period for Lionel. And that's the era of Lionel trains spanning from about 1900 until around 1942 when the United States entered into World War II. And then of course during the war Lionel stopped making trains and had to make supplies for the military. But after the war ended, they started making trains again and entered into what is called the post-war period, lasting from around 1945 to 1969. And of course, that was the era where they made so many of the legendary trains that most of our dads and granddads ran when they were kids. Now, during the pre-war period, Lionel made what are called tin plate trains, which were toy trains made from stamped sheet metal with trimmings of brass or nickel. They were very beautiful, very artistic trains. They made two different sizes, standard gauge and O-gauge. Standard gauge was the high-end line that was very expensive. O-gauge was the low-end line that was marketed to people that couldn't afford standard gauge. Now, as we all know, eventually O-gauge won out, and when Lionel started making trains again after World War II, they never made standard gauge trains again. They simply focused on O-gauge. Now, as beautiful as the tin plate trains were, and I'm a big fan of tin plate trains, they just weren't that realistic looking. And there were several reasons for this. First of all, there's just only so much detail you can get into a piece of stamped sheet metal. Secondly, a lot of the designs for the tin plate trains came from Italian design firms, both in America and overseas in Italy. And Italian designers wanted showy, flashy trains that were kind of like caricatures of real trains. And then finally, Joshua Lionel Cowan himself did not like drab colors that were more prototypical. He wanted flashy colors like reds and yellows and creams and oranges because he knew that the mother was the principal shopper in the family and those bright colors would catch mom's eye in the store window and make her more likely to buy a Lionel train than a train made by one of their competitors. And now, because of all those things, pre-war trains just weren't very realistic, and Lionel was not considered to be a maker of realistic model trains. They were considered toy trains for kids. Well, Joshua Lionel Cowan wanted to change that perception. He didn't want Lionel just to be known for toy trains, but for making high-end model trains as well that adults could enjoy in addition to children. And so, in 1937, using relatively new die-casting technology, Lionel released a very realistic, very prototypical scale model of the New York Central 464 Hudson, and they called it the 700E. And it looked very much like the model that you're looking at now. The 700E was a revolution in model railroading and offered features and details and realism that had never been seen before, especially in O-Gage. It even had its own new track system. Lionel designed a new track system called T-Rail just for the 700E, and it was a much more prototypical looking track system than Lionel's traditional tubular track. But the 700E was also very expensive. It cost $75 for the engine, and that was in 1937. And in 1937, $75 was a lot of money. And so for that reason, Lionel also offered the 700E in kit form, so you could build it piece by piece as your budget permitted. But nevertheless, it was a very lavish engine in a time when people didn't have a whole lot of disposable income. And so for that reason, even though the 700E made a huge impact on the model railroading world, it wasn't a runaway success, and Lionel only made it for two years, and they stopped production in 1939. Now, the 700E has gone on to become one of the most, if not the most, legendary engines that Lionel ever made. Not only because they were so beautiful and realistic, but because they paved the way for things to come in the post-war period. Because when Lionel started making trains again after World War II, they didn't go back to making tin plate trains. They followed in the footsteps of the 700E and made much more realistic looking 
die cast trains. Now granted the post-war trains weren't nearly as detailed as the 700E and most of them weren't built to scale but they took a lot of ideas from the 700E and that was one of the components that led to the great success Lionel had in the post-war years. So because of the legendary status of the 700E, Lionel has done several reissues over the years. And so now we come into the 21st century and we have Lionel's Vision line of products, which represents the very best high-end O-scale trains possible. And so using the technology and the features of the 21st century, we now get the 700E that Joshua Lionel Cowan wishes he could have made in 1937, the Vision Line 700E Hudson. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that little condensed history lesson about the 700E. Now let's talk about this model. When you're making a decision on whether or not you want to buy one of these new 700Es, it's important to have the right perspective. If you buy this engine looking for an ultra prototypical, super realistic high-end steam engine, you may be a little disappointed. But if you buy it looking for a 21st century vision line version of the legendary 700E from 1937, you're going to absolutely love this engine. You know, when Lionel made this new 700E, they actually used some of the tooling from the original 700E back in 1937. That fact alone means that this engine is not going to be nearly as intricately detailed as modern O-scale steam engines made today, because the tooling methods in 1937 were much more primitive than the tooling methods today. So you're just not going to get that level of detail on this engine. But that's okay, because Lionel didn't want that. If they had added all that extra detail, and if they had fixed all the errors on the original 700E, this wouldn't be a 700E. It would just be a really nice Hudson. They wanted to do a reissue of the 700E, a vision line version of the 700E, and that's exactly what they did. So as long as you keep the right perspective, you're going to love this engine. The Vision Line 700E was first made available in Lionel's 2010 Volume 1 catalog, and then it was finally delivered earlier this year in 2011. Now they offered two colors, a black version like you see here, and then a gray version, even though the original 700E only came in a black version. Now whichever color you choose, you're going to get Lionel's Legacy Command System, and you're also going to get a host of Vision Line specific features that I'll show you in just a few minutes when we fire this thing up. All right, let's take a look at some of the details on this engine. Right up here in front, we've got a scale drop coupler. It pops up like that and locks into place, and then when you don't need it, you pull it out and pop it down like that. If you would rather have a three-rail coupler, Lionel supplies the engine with a dummy three-rail coupler right here, and all you do is turn the engine over, undo one screw to remove the scale coupler, and then install the dummy coupler, and that way you can double-head this engine. Up here, we've got a nice coupler cut bar. We've got nice stanchion detail here and nice step detail on either side. Lots of nice rivet detail all over the place. Got an operating headlight, operating number boards, and operating marker lights up here. And then finally, the boiler door swings open like that to reveal a nicely detailed interior. You've got this wire to deal with for the headlight, but other than that, it's a really nice touch. Down here on the underside of the engine, we've got four wheels on the lead truck six drive wheels and four wheels on the trailing truck so therefore this engine would be designated as a 464 type locomotive the rear set of drive wheels are equipped with traction tires to increase pulling power in the event you need to change the traction tires Lionel includes this little wrench tool with the engine and this will allow you to safely remove these nuts on the drive rods and get access to the wheels and change the tires I want to show you something real quick on the side of the engine. If you look right here, on most high-end O-scale steam engines made today, right here is where you would have the accurate and legible builder's plates. But look, the only plate we've got here is one that says built by Lionel. Well, hey, that's not very prototypical now, is it? But it's a perfect example of what I was talking about a few minutes ago. This is not meant to be a modern reproduction of a Hudson steam engine. It's a reproduction of the original 700E that Lionel built in 1937. And like the original 700E, it does not have accurate builder's plates, but instead just has the built by Lionel plate. So where this model is not being very true to an actual Hudson steam engine, it is being very true to the original 700E. And that's the whole point. The top of the engine is loaded with all sorts of cool features. Right up here we've got the smokestack that puts off lots of white smoke when the engine is in operation. And for those of you who are new to the hobby, all you do to load the smoke in there is just take your smoke fluid and squirt it right down the stack. Behind that we've got the incredible vision line swinging bell. When the bell is activated on the engine, the bell swings back and forth 
in time with the sounds of the bell. It's really cool. You'll see that in just a minute when we turn this engine on. Behind that, we've got the sand dome, and the top pops off to reveal the engine controls. You've got your run program switch, your Odyssey speed control switch, and your on-off switches for the main smoke unit as well as the auxiliary smoke unit, which in this case is the smoking whistle. I'll show you that right now. Here's the smoking whistle, and the way it works is that there's a hole underneath the whistle right here, and when you blow the whistle, smoke shoots out of that hole and gives the illusion that steam is shooting out of the whistle, just like on a real steam whistle on a real steam engine. To load the smoke unit for the whistle with smoke fluid, what you do is remove the whistle, like that, and then you pour the smoke fluid down into this hole here. Now to keep from making a mess, I would recommend one of two ways to load the smoke fluid. You could either use a small funnel, like this, or you can do what I do. I've got a needle point dispenser on my smoke fluid bottle, and I just stick it down there like that and give it a good squirt. Now before you put the whistle back on, a good tip for this smoke unit and any other smoke unit in general is to lean over it and blow gently down into both of these holes after you load the smoke fluid in and that will help to dislodge any smoke fluid bubbles that may prevent the smoke unit from operating correctly. And then once you've done that, you put the whistle back on, just like that. The outside of the cab is nicely detailed. We've got plastic windows here, here, and on the back. These side windows are kind of old school because most modern O-scale steam engines would have windows that would open and close, but they kept the design of the windows from the original 700E. We've got nice rivet detail all over the cab, very crisp numbering down here, and then up on top we've got these vents that open up like that. Here's a look under the cab. We've got the draw bar here, and then here's the optical sensor that allows the electronics in the tender to communicate with the engine. Here's a look at the inside of the cab. They did a wonderful job in here. You've got two crew figures, a whole wealth of knobs and valves and all sorts of detail. You've got lighted gauges, as you can see up top, and then red valves above those. When the engine is on, there's a red firebox glow, and there's also a cab light, and then the cab light automatically shuts off when the engine starts moving. The tender is also very nicely done. Just like the engine, it's all die cast metal. We've got separately applied grab irons and ladders and so forth all over the place. Really nice rivet detail all over the tender. Up on top here, we've got a real coal load. Back here, this hatch opens up to reveal the master volume control. And then back here, we've got the reverse light. Now keep in mind, this tender is probably not the most detailed tender you've ever seen. But again, remember that this is not meant to be a modern production super detailed steam engine. It's meant to emulate the original 700E from 1937, so that's okay. On the underside of the tender, we've got one pickup roller per truck. And on the underside of the engine, you've got a set of two pickup rollers here and then another set here. The last thing I want to talk about before we fire this thing up is the paint job. You're going to notice when you get one of these engines that the black paint has a little bit more of a glossy finish to it than most modern O-scale steam engines made today. And I believe that was done on purpose because the original 700E in 1937 also had a more glossy finish to it. And so in keeping with the original 700E, this model also has a more glossy finish. All right, let's go ahead and start this thing up. 
Okay, I'm about ready to roll it out, but when I do, I'm going to show you a new feature on this engine called Rail Sound Sequence Control. And what that is, is that when you activate sequence control, the engine will automatically play the appropriate sounds that are needed for whatever action the engine is taking. So if you start the engine up, it'll play the appropriate sounds, it'll blow the whistle, sound the bell, and do some cab chatter. And then as you reach a cruising speed, as you reach top speed, and as you slow down and come in for a stop, it'll play the appropriate sounds all automatically. So let's go ahead and do that. To activate sequence control, you just hold down the AUX1 button for three seconds, and then it'll play a sound to let you know it's been activated. So let's do that. Okay, it's activated, so now let's roll it out. Before I wrap up this review, I do want to share one final thought with you. I think it's very fitting that the 700E now joins the Vision line of products because I see a lot of parallels between the Vision line and the original 700E from 1937. You know, when Lionel released the 700E in 1937, America was still in the Great Depression. And so to release an ultra-high-end $75 engine in the middle of a depression was a really bold move. And the Vision Line has that same boldness. The Vision Line debuted in 2009, which was right in the middle of this great recession that we're in. And to put out a line of ultra high-end expensive products in the middle of a recession was a really bold move. And so for that reason, I think it's very fitting that the 700E, a symbol of Lionel's boldness and determination to put out the very best possible product in 1937, now joins the Vision line of products, which has the exact same goal. Okay, so that about wraps it up for this review. I hope you enjoyed it. Lionel has done an outstanding job of making a 21st century Vision Line version of the legendary 700E. It looks amazing and it runs like a dream. If you're interested in picking one of these up, they retail for about $1,600, although you can probably get one for a little bit less if you go through a good dealer. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time.